Good morning. This is Tanisha Williams with the Florida Sheriff's Association, and on behalf of our President, Sheriff Jerry Demings, and Executive Director Steve Casey, I'd like to welcome you to our Law Enforcement Use of Naloxone webinar. This webinar will provide comprehensive information regarding the use of naloxone for opioid overdoses. Before we begin our presentation, we'd like to remind you of a few housekeeping tips. Please mute your phones or your computer microphone during the presentation. Please do not put the call on hold, and at the end of the presentation, we will open up the line for questions. Our presenter for today is Amanda Muller. Amanda serves as an overdose prevention coordinator within the Office of Substance Abuse and Mental Health at the Florida Department of Children and Families. Prior to her role at DCF, Ms. Muller worked for the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition and provided overdose prevention trainings to first responders, medical professionals, and community members at risk of witnessing or experiencing an opioid overdose. She has engaged in community-based naloxone distribution to help save lives and provide critical harm reduction education. Welcome, Amanda. Hi, everybody. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, our learning objectives are on the screen. Um, we're going to go over some basic uh, opioid epidemic information in the United States and in Florida, go over overdose recognition and response, and the medication known as naloxone, which reverses uh, an opiate overdose. We're also going to review some of the laws in Florida that allow for these activities to take place. Um, so just basic information, I'm going to use opioids or opiates interchangeably throughout this presentation, um, any prescription medications to treat or manage pain, as well as illicit opioids such as uh, heroin. So there's some on the screen here um, commonly referred to as narcotics within law enforcement, um, and now we're seeing even some more synthetic opioids that are more dangerous than heroin, uh, like fentanyl and carfentanil, but it also still includes hydrocodone, oxycodone, um, and prescription pain medication. I'm not going to go over uh, much of these statistics, just the main point is that uh, drug overdose has become the leading cause of unintentional injury death in the United States. Um, for a very long time, that was always car accidents. In 2014, it has surpassed car accidents as the leading cause of unintentional injury death among people of most ages, 25 to 64 years old, um, and we've only seen that continue to rise. In Florida, we rank fourth in the nation when it comes to the number of drug overdose deaths. In 2015, we had over 3,200. Um, it translates to about seven people per day being lost to overdose in Florida. So when we talk about strategies that can reduce um, the number of fatal overdose deaths, we're talking about risk reduction strategies, also known as harm reduction, which is really any strategy or idea that can reduce negative consequences associated with a behavior that can be risky. So in this context, we're talking about drug use. Um, but it really doesn't have to be, harm reduction does not just have to be related to drug use. So examples would be safe sex education. Um, places that teach abstinence only safe sex, safe sex education do have higher rates of uh, unintended pregnancies and STDs. Um, when we provide the tools necessary to protect individuals, not, not encouraging them to engage in these activities, but acknowledging that they do exist, um, we see lower rates of unwanted pregnancies and STDs. Uh, seat belts are an example of harm reduction. So driving is a very dangerous activity. There's tens of thousands of car accidents every year, um, but we follow speed limits, we wear seat belts, we stop at stop signs. So those are all harm reduction measures to make uh, a risky behavior a little more safer. So when we're talking about drug use, that could mean somebody using drugs in a more safe manner, making sure that they're not uh, contracting any infectious diseases like HIV or hepatitis, that they're not dying of an overdose. It could mean complete abstinence for some individuals. Um, so the strategy we're talking about today in terms of harm reduction is overdose prevention education. So teaching people how not to die fatally of a drug overdose, uh, if they are at risk for overdose, if they're using drugs, um, but also teaching their family members, their friends, anybody who might be a bystander or witness to an overdose, how to intervene, recognize it, and save that person's life. So we're going to go over some uh, basic overdose recognition and response. Um, when someone takes opioids, they would first experience pain relief. The more and more you take, um, the more symptoms you're going to experience that are listed on the screen here. So intoxication eventually 
respiratory depression, meaning that you your your breathing is very shallow, eventually you stop breathing, and that's what would actually result in death in an opiate overdose is that you don't have any oxygen. So you basically go into respiratory arrest or depression, stop breathing, and you die from a lack of oxygen. So there's kind of a clip art version of this on the screen here, but essentially you have specific receptors in your brain called mu receptors. When you ingest opioids, those opioids specifically seek out and bind to those receptors, kind of like a key fitting into a lock. So the more and more of those receptors that get occupied by opioids, meaning the more opioids that you take or the stronger uh, opioid that you are ingesting, um, the more of those symptoms you're going to experience with the pain relief, then intoxication, respiratory depression, and eventually death. So a little bit later, we're going to see how the reversal medication interacts with this. Some risk factors for overdose, why are people overdosing in the first place? Um, mixing different types of drugs is definitely a very significant uh, risk factor when it comes to overdose. So most uh, drug overdoses are a mix of substances, um, whether it's alcohol mixed with cocaine uh, or benzodiazepines like Xanax or heroin and Xanax. Um, I've done a lot of outreach to people who use drugs and sometimes there is a misconception that if you take a downer with an upper, uh, they'll just cancel each other out, which is not true, and they would amplify each other's effects and increase somebody's risk of overdose. Uh, the quality of drug of the drug that somebody is taking is also a very significant risk factor, especially when we're talking about uh, street market drugs. So people buying heroin on the street now, um, you know, it is being laced with other substances like fentanyl, sometimes carfentanil or other synthetic fentanyl analogs that are much, much stronger than regular heroin. So when people use that and don't know that it's much stronger, they are likely to die of an overdose. So we've, we're now seeing people who have been using drugs for a long time starting to die of an overdose at a higher rate because it is being laced with other things. Um, low tolerance uh, is also a risk factor for overdose. So if somebody undergoes a period of abstinence, meaning that they don't use drugs for a period of time, even just three days. When it comes to opioids, because they're in abstinence-based drug treatment, they're going through detox, or because they're incarcerated, um, their tolerance gets really low, meaning it's not going to take as much of the drug it used to take to get the same effects. So once they are discharged from drug treatment or detox or released from incarceration, if they do relapse, and a lot of people do, relapse is very common, um, and they go back to using the same amount of the drug they used to use every day, they are likely to overdose. When people are also using, I have using alone on the screen, really when, it, when you're using behind a locked door, when you know, there is still a lot of stigma attached to drug addiction, so they might, somebody might not tell their friends and family that they have relapsed or seek help, uh, no one is going to be there to call 911 or administer naloxone to help save your life. So based on those risk factors, who is at risk for opiate overdose? Um, really anybody who's taking any opioids in any capacity. So even people who are using prescription opioids for chronic pain management as prescribed are still at risk for overdose. Um, sometimes in the elderly population, people might mix up their medications, forget that they already took their pain medication and accidentally take too much, or it might have an interaction with other prescribed medications that they're legally on. Um, but again, due to the low tolerance, people being discharged from drug treatment uh, or jail or prison, people in medication-assisted treatment like methadone or buprenorphine if they're using drugs outside of those programs, as well as people using illicit opioids such as heroin. So the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose, and I'm sure in basic law enforcement training they go over, you know, a lot of these signs and symptoms can fall under other conditions. So the main thing is that somebody is going to be unresponsive. They're not going to respond to shouting their name or, or any kind of stimuli. Um, their skin, lips, or nails could be blue or pale due to lack of oxygen. Uh, their heartbeat could be really slow. Their breathing can be really slow or regular, or they may not be breathing at all. Um, they could sound like they're snoring, uh, which is actually called a death rattle, meaning they're really not getting much oxygen. But somebody in the community might just kind of dismiss that as, oh, they're just passed out and, and snoring, um, when actually they're not getting a lot of oxygen. They're, they could have pinpoint pupils, um, other gastrointestinal issues like throwing up. They could have thrown up and then passed out. 
Um, so these, all of these signs would be for an opiate overdose. The main thing is that they're going to be unresponsive. So the reason we teach uh, overdose prevention education and how to reverse an overdose and recognize it is because in the community, um, if people are scared to call for help, if people are scared to call 911 because there's illegal drugs at the scene and they might get in trouble, uh, they resort to these other instances that they think work to reverse an overdose, which actually do not. Um, so if they're scared to call 911, they might just let their friend sleep it off, thinking that, you know, they're just nodding in and out, they'll be fine, that person actually ends up dying. Um, they, you know, might put them in a cold shower or bath or put ice on them, try to make them vomit, give them coffee or water, uh, beat, punch, or kick them, uh, injecting them with other substances. I've heard all kinds of crazy things. Um, some of them are up here, salt water, like cocaine or stimulants, milk, I've heard of other <laughs> mayonnaise, all kinds of stuff. Um, none of these things work. The only thing you should be injecting someone with would be naloxone if you're using an injectable form. Um, really, again, the person just needs oxygen, and none of the things on the screen here would give that person oxygen. Um, all of these things also take a long, you know, take up a lot of time. If you're running a cold bath, trying to get them to walk around, uh, you're really wasting precious time when every second this person's not getting oxygen would be critical. So we really don't want anybody to resort to those tactics uh, in the community or among anyone who might witness or experience an overdose, and we want to teach them the proper way to uh, respond to an overdose and not waste any time, immediately call 911 and start uh, overdose response. So law enforcement is a critical partner when it comes to overdose response. Um, there are times when law enforcement may be the first to the scene of an overdose due to a couple reasons. Um, EMS response times are really great, but there are still instances where law enforcement might arrive at the scene of an overdose first. It also depends how the call was, was called in to 911 to see who was dispatched. Um, even if law enforcement arrives two minutes before EMS, you know, every second this person is not getting oxygen would be critical to administer naloxone. Um, they, you know, law enforcement officers do have frequent interactions with high-risk populations and people who use drugs. They can make a positive health impact with overdose prevention tools like naloxone. Um, there is also a potential for accidental, accidental exposure uh, from these substances among law enforcement during a search or a raid. Uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration has a video up that talks about these two New Jersey officers who were doing a, a normal search um, and accidentally hit one of the bags and a bunch of fentanyl uh, went in the air and they accidentally inhaled it. Um, and they both started overdosing. The law enforcement there had naloxone. They reversed the overdose of their fellow officers. So, you know, obviously you need to take care of yourself and they're warning cops not to do any field tests on these substances and immediately take them to the lab. Um, but just in case there was an accidental exposure, this would also be appropriate for that. Um, there's also situations where law enforcement might just be patrolling the community and a call was never even made to 911 to get EMS's attention. Um, but if law enforcement just discovers someone who looks like they're overdosing, maybe in an alley or just in a neighborhood or in a high drug use area, they would be able to administer naloxone and law enforcement would be able to, to call EMS. So we're going to go through the steps uh, geared towards law enforcement responding to an overdose. Some of this was taken from uh, different protocols and policies and procedures from law enforcement in Florida and other states who have implemented naloxone programs. Um, it's not completely uh, exclusive to these steps at all. Uh, every agency kind of adapts it to the culture of their agency. But the first thing would be ensuring the safety of the scene for the officer. Um, you know, you're not just going to immediately run up to someone and administer the naloxone. You would obviously make sure that nobody else is uh, on the scene or um, hiding in certain areas, uh, there aren't any weapons there, et cetera. Um, if an ambulance has not already been dispatched, then you would request an ambulance be dispatched to your location. Once uh, the scene is secure, then you would assess the, sub the subject to check for unresponsiveness. Um, obviously, any universal precautions, especially that your agency follows when it comes to OSHA and other guidelines to protect yourself from communicable communicable diseases and bloodborne pathogens. So once you've ensured the safety of the scene, you would check the person for responsiveness. Again, the number one thing is that this person will be unresponsive if they're experiencing an opiate overdose. So the easiest way to do that would be to perform a sternal rub. There is a pictured image of this on the screen, 
Um, basically, the person would be laying on their back. You would need to make sure that there's nothing in their mouth or their throat. They have a clear air passage. Um, and you make a fist with your hand and just press it on the chest of the individual, and you kind of rub it up and down on the chest bone, which is the sternum. So this uh, you're, is supposed to replace, like, beating or punching or throwing the person in cold water, any of those things. Um, this does inflict a safe amount of pain that would wake the person up. You're hoping that they would wake up and be like, what are you doing? That hurts really bad. And then, okay, you know, you're alive. Um, if they don't wake up from this within a couple seconds, you know they're unresponsive. So in the community, we advise as soon as somebody doesn't wake up from a sternal rub to call 911. Uh, since you are law enforcement, you would do a sternal rub, and if they are unresponsive, you can move to your next step. So rescue breathing or CPR. I have the rescue breathing instructions on the screen because CPR is more of a certification. Um, some law enforcement agencies, uh, or all of them, you know, you guys do have annual or biannual CPR recertification classes. So if your agency teaches CPR, then that's what you would go with. Honestly, in terms of an overdose, since CPR is more so chest compressions to get the heart pumping, uh, rescue breathing is more appropriate because you are just trying to get oxygen into the person's body. So if you are doing rescue breathing correctly, uh, the person's head would be tilted back. Uh, you pinch their nose and open their mouth, but um, as pictured here, law enforcement do have access to uh, mouth gears or breathing masks that you would use. And you give the person one breath every five seconds. If you're doing it correctly, their chest should rise, meaning you are getting oxygen into their lungs. Uh, if you see their stomach rising, then that could actually make the individual throw up, which is not what we would want. So essentially, you should be performing rescue breathing either while the naloxone is being prepared to be administered. So if there's another law enforcement officer on the scene with you, one of you could be preparing the naloxone while the other one is performing rescue breathing. Um, and after you administer a first dose of naloxone, you would continue rescue breathing until EMS arrives. So the next step would be to administer naloxone. Um, there's a couple different kinds. So one type of kit is pictured up here, and I'm going to go briefly through the kinds of naloxone that are available. Um, so there's intramuscular naloxone, which is an injection. Uh, into the muscle, so it would be the thigh, upper arm, or butt of the individual, so you are just getting it into the muscle. Um, there are generic and brand versions of each type of naloxone. So the generic version is pictured in the upper right corner. Um, it comes with two vials of the generic medication, and then you would purchase separately intramuscular syringes. I will say this is not the common one to go with among law enforcement because it does involve a syringe, um, which complicates things a little bit. I am mentioning it because it is an naloxone product available, um, and a lot of community-based organizations and other uh, groups prefer this product because it is the cheapest one for people to get. Um, another option for intramuscular is pictured in the bottom right corner of the screen, which is an auto-injector, so this is the brand name version of an intramuscular naloxone. Um, the auto-injector uh, has a two milligram dose, per milliliter, while the generic is a 0.4 milligram, so the auto-injector is a bit stronger, which sometimes is necessary, sometimes it is not. Um, I will say the auto-injector is a very pricey product. Um, it's about $4,500, so we don't really advise that people would bulk purchase it and, and stock it to their law enforcement agency, but the manufacturer does sometimes, you can apply for free donated products from the manufacturer, so you would actually get it at zero cost to your agency. Um, you just need to have a medical prescriber listed on your account with the manufacturer, and you can apply for free auto injectors. So we do have some law enforcement agencies in Florida that have that product. It works really well. Um, it talks to you as you administer it, so it kind of walks you through the steps um, like a built-in trainer. Um, so if you can apply for free products, then I would highly suggest doing that. Um, with any naloxone, uh, it's common to give one dose, continue to support rescue breathing for two to three minutes, and if the person is still not uh, awake, you would give administer a second dose, continue rescue breathing, and repeat. In the case of law enforcement, by the time you administer the first dose and continue rescue breathing, EMS is probably already going to be on the scene. So you probably won't have to even go to administering a second dose um, if EMS is, is right behind you guys or, or not far behind. 
So there's also internasal naloxone, so that's a nasal spray. And there, again, there's a generic version and a brand name version. Um, nasal naloxone does work even if the person is not breathing, which is a common question. Um, it just gets absorbed into their nasal mucosal membrane. So if it didn't work while someone wasn't breathing, it would be the worst product ever because no one is going to be, for the most part, breathing if they're actually overdosing on opiates. Um, so the generic version is in the top right corner of the screen. This is a very common one used among EMS and fire departments, as I understand it, um, across the country. So it comes with, in the very, very top right corner, um, a pre-filled syringe without the needle um, of the medication. You insert it into this plunger that has the yellow cap on it, and you also attach this little atomizer or mucosal atomization device, a MAD device, um, and it would turn it into a nasal spray. So with that one, half the dose would go up each nostril. The other option uh, is the bottom right corner, which is the brand name version of a naloxone, a Narcan nasal spray. Um, so that one is kind of already put together and you would just kind of press this plunger on the bottom and insert the full dose into somebody's nose. So we have law enforcement using both of these products in Florida. Um, I think it really just comes down to cost or what kind of deal you can work out with the manufacturer. Um, some agencies are able to kind of switch products between their fire department or EMS. So if EMS has additional products, they would supply it to the law enforcement. Um, or if law enforcement did order naloxone, not enough of it has been used and it's close to expiration date, they might trade it out with their EMS or fire agency because EMS and fire use it all the time. So those kits would get used before being expired. Um, and again, same thing with nasal naloxone, you would administer one dose, continue to support rescue breathing for two to three minutes, administer the second dose if needed, but again, EMS would probably be on the scene by that point. So these are just some images of law enforcement trainings um, administering, this is the generic nasal naloxone with the little atomizer so you can kind of see how it works. Um, if you did want actual, this is more of a brief overview of overdose recognition and response. But if you wanted an actual training for your law enforcement agency, um, you know, it would be common to use rescue breathing dummies so people can uh, practice rescue breathing and actually practice administering the naloxone on a rescue breathing dummy um, with either expired medication or, you know, an empty syringe with water in it or, or some sort of demo kit that we can get. Um, so training would be a little more comprehensive when it comes to actually implementing this kind of program in your law enforcement agency and you would have the officers actually practice doing it um, before being out in the field. So if the person is revived before EMS is on the scene, you would place them in the recovery position, uh, their hands supporting their head, their knee preventing them from rolling onto their stomach. So it is crucial to obviously communicate with EMS when they do arrive on the scene that you, that you inform them that naloxone was administered to the individual and how much you gave them because that will determine EMS's response a little bit more. Um, if the person is still not awake or revived or even breathing when EMS arrives on the scene and you tell them, I gave them two doses of this kind of naloxone, that's gonna um, kind of change how much EMS is going to give this individual. Uh, if you have no naloxone on the scene, then EMS is definitely going to administer naloxone to this individual. Um, when EMS arrives, you would just transfer care of that individual to EMS and fire. Um, and follow your agency's protocols for reporting uh, the use of naloxone on a civilian. So this is where it gets, you know, it can be very specific to your agency um, in terms of how it gets reported and how you would transfer care to EMS and fire. Um, this medication has been used by EMS and fire departments for 40 or 50 years, so it's certainly not a new medication. Um, it's just being expanded to other people in the community like law enforcement, uh, family and friends of people who are addicted to opiates so they can also intervene and reverse an overdose. So I have some uh, copies up here. It's very small print. I just wanted to briefly show you what they look like, but I can, uh, we can either send them out or maybe post them as a, as a resource page. Um, of law enforcement departments who've implemented naloxone programs, they have policies and procedures in place. So we have a couple of them from Florida law enforcement agencies that I'm sure they would not mind us sharing with fellow law enforcement officers if someone wanted to implement this kind of program. You guys don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, a lot of the protocols are very, very similar and you can just adapt them to your agency. Uh, this one is from, I think, Vermont State Police Department as an example. 
And then there's also reporting forms as an example. So this is a really comprehensive one, um, but there's also simpler versions. So again, that would be specific to your agency when you use naloxone, how they want to track it, how they want to report it. Um, this one is from the New York State Police Department, and it's this is half of the form. It kind of asks, you know, what other response or uh, aid did you provide to this individual? What time did you arrive on the scene? When did EMS arrive? Uh, was naloxone administered? How much? That kind of stuff. Um, and it has some additional questions right here. You know, what hospital was this individual transported to? Did they live? Yes or no? A simpler one, this example is from the Orlando Police Department, and this is not their completed form. They have some information about HIPAA and everything at the bottom, and I believe maybe redact the personal information before this becomes public record of the individual. But this one is a little bit simpler, just the date of the incident, um, the location, the name of the person who was administered a lock zone, you know, was it administered, was it successful? These are just some examples. Um, we, you know, there are other ones. There's a naloxone law enforcement toolkit that there's a link to at the end of this presentation. These slides will be posted so you can have access to those links. Um, and they have, you know, a bunch of different policies and procedures from law enforcement around the country, uh, sample reporting forms, um, everything that you can really adapt specific to your agency so you don't have to recreate all of these things. Um, so just some more information about the actual medication itself now that we've gone through how you would actually respond and how you'd use it. Um, it is FDA approved. It's a prescription medication. It's not a controlled substance. It's an opioid or opiate antagonist, um, meaning it reverses opioid overdoses. Um, it's, again, it's been used for over 40 years by paramedics. Uh, it's not psychoactive, can't be abused, it doesn't cause overdose. Um, it does not work on other types of drug overdoses, so it does only work for opioids, you know, heroin, pain medication, fentanyl, carfentanil. Um, multiple doses of naloxone might be needed depending on the strength of the substance that somebody took. You know, with carfentanil and some of these other things that are much stronger than heroin, uh, you'll, you'll probably need more than one dose of naloxone, um, but not always. So it really depends on the person's tolerance level, what they took, when you discovered them, how long they've been out, all of these other factors. Um, but it doesn't work on other types of overdoses like cocaine, alcohol, Xanax. The thing is, though, uh, since most overdoses, as mentioned before, are a mix of substances, if somebody's on heroin and alcohol and they're overdosing, the naloxone can reverse the heroin component of that overdose um, and, and still save that individual, even though it won't do anything for the alcohol in their system. It's such a safe medication that if you do administer it to someone who does not have opioids in their system, it has zero effects. Um, if you were to take some right now and you have no opiates in, their, in your system, it would be like you drank some water. So uh, it's really common practice for EMS on the scene to just immediately administer naloxone to someone that is at all as suspected of being uh, in an opiate overdose. I think it's like a shot of glucose, maybe a shot of naloxone and something else. Um, because if, if opiates are not in their system, it's completely no harm done. Um, so you really don't have to know what the individual took. Uh, it won't have any other interactions with other substances in their system. It does sound similar to some other medications, so I just wanted to clarify that this is not Suboxone uh, or Naltrexone, commonly known as Vivitrol, uh, which are medications used to treat opiate addiction. These are opioids themselves, and they are used uh, in combination with counseling and other treatment programs to actually reduce cravings and withdrawal symptoms and the effect of other opioids on individuals uh, addicted to opioids. But naloxone is, are not these medications. You know, we don't recommend that anyone use these medi suboxone or naltrexone to reverse an overdose. They're not the same thing. I know they sound very similar. Um, I'm not spending too much time on this since you'll be able to look at this, but this is basically the manufacturers of all the different naloxone products. Um, we have no preference on whichever products people would want to purchase. Um, we can just recommend, you know, I, I really think that they're all appropriate in certain settings. So I think it comes down to cost, what your agency is comfortable with when it comes to what your officers are comfortable using, since some of the products have just different techniques. Um, but it kind of lists up here the phone numbers and websites that you can contact to get the most updated information on the different products, depending on which one you might want to go with. So how naloxone interacts with opioids. This is a slide we saw earlier with um, opioids attaching and occupying to certain receptors in your brain, which can eventually lead to someone overdosing. When Narcan or naloxone is administered, 
um, it's the green kind of globule there on the screen, it will go into the receptor, kick the opioid off the receptor, and the naloxone is going to occupy that receptor instead. So that is the antagonist quality. It goes in, kicks the opioids off the receptor, and it actually blocks them from reattaching. So essentially, it has a stronger affinity to these receptors than opioids do, meaning it goes in and it kicks them off blocks them from reattaching for a certain amount of time. Um, that is what actually reverses somebody's overdose and, and revives them. So um, naloxone works within two to three minutes. It does totally depend on what they took, how much they took, how strong the opioid was when they were discovered. So multiple doses may be needed to reverse an overdose. You should wait a couple minutes between each dose uh, you're not trying to give someone way too much naloxone, um, even though they won't die from it or anything. Um, it does put the individual into withdrawal, which we're going to go into, and it's kind of a combination of wanting to revive the individual but not make their withdrawal as severe as possible. So naloxone does last for 30 to 90 minutes, so some opioids can actually outlast the naloxone. So it is possible a person can slip back into an overdose once naloxone wears off in 30 to 90 minutes. Um, they should be transported to the hospital, supervised under medical care. They may need additional doses of naloxone if they were to start overdosing again, even if they don't use again, just because Narcan wears off and they still have opioids in their system. The same steps would be taken. Um, they would be administered additional naloxone and their overdose would be reversed. This, is, this has a misconception of being extremely common. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not as common as one might think that people just slip back into an overdose every single time after they're administered naloxone. Um, it does happen, but it's, it's not, you know, 100% of the time that this is occurring. We do still advise everyone would be going to the hospital when we teach overdose prevention trainings to the community. That is uh, what we advise. It does cause uh, withdrawal symptoms in people who are opiate addicted or dependent. Um, so they could be vomiting, upset, stomach, very confused and disoriented, uh, any of the symptoms listed here. It is rare, again, that people are physically violent when they wake up from an overdose. It's occurred, but it is extremely rare. Um, they might be aggressive in terms of very disoriented and confused, but not physically violent when it comes to being woken up from an overdose. Um, all naloxone products are good for about two years. By the time you actually get the product, it might be more of an 18-month expiration date. The storage requirements are listed on the screen. For law enforcement, um, it's been common to either store the kits in the passenger compartment of the vehicle while you're on duty. Uh, you can store it in, depending on which product you get and the size of it, you can store it in like your actual shirt pocket. Um, it's common just not to store it in the trunk of the vehicle or keep it in there overnight. So they can kind of check them in uh, for their shift every, every time. In terms of disposal, um, a lot of departments have implemented it as sharps and biomedical waste, uh, whether or not it was an injection. Um, they can be disposed in the sharps containers on EMS units or fire departments. So common misconceptions would be that naloxone provides a safety net or encourages drug use or sends the wrong message. Um, a lot of studies have been done on overdose prevention. This is simply not true. It does not encourage anyone to use drugs who is not already using drugs. Um, it's similar to like having a fire extinguisher in your house does not encourage you to start a fire, but if you do start a fire in your house accidentally, um, you're going to be very glad that you have that safety measure. Really, this is just an EpiPen for opiate overdose. Um, it also causes really unpleasant withdrawal symptoms in individuals, and no one is aiming to overdose. It's generally accidental, and it's going to be a very bad experience for this individual. Um, I'm going to move a little bit quickly through these. It does not replace calling 911. You know, we do advise that everybody call 911, go to the hospital, and seek treatment. Um, sometimes it can actually increase somebody's desire to seek treatment because they just almost died of an overdose. Um, and we kind of already went over this point in that it is rare that someone would kind of wake up swinging. Um, they might be upset that they are no longer high and didn't realize that they were actually just about to overdose, but um, it is rare that somebody does actually wake up swinging. So we're going to go through quickly the legislation in Florida that does allow for these kinds of laws. So the 911 Good Samaritan Act encourages people to call 911 during an overdose. 
the reason for that is uh, in 50% of overdose cases, someone was there to intervene. No one was calling 911, and the number one reason was fear of police involvement uh, because illegal drugs or other things were at the scene. So we really just want to reduce barriers to people calling 911, uh, pr basically provide them with immunity if they do call 911 uh, during an overdose so that that person's life can be saved and they don't have to worry about flushing their drugs down the toilet or cleaning up the scene before calling 911. Um, so we've had this law in Florida since 2012. Basically, the person who calls 911 uh, and the person overdosing can't be charged, prosecuted, or penalized for possession of controlled substances if that was found as a result of law enforcement being on the scene because they were summoned due to the overdose. We also have a naloxone law in Florida that was passed in 2015 and expanded in 2016. Um, and the link to the statute is up there. But essentially, it just allows prescribers and pharmacists to prescribe and dispense naloxone to anyone at risk of witnessing or experiencing an overdose, um, which is kind of a third-party prescribing situation, allowing um, you know, your sister to be prescribed naloxone in case her mom is addicted to opioids and she might need to intervene. So you can't ever use naloxone on yourself. Third-party prescribing is really necessary in these situations. It also authorizes law enforcement and lay people in the community to possess, store, and administer naloxone to someone uh, who they believe in good faith is overdosing. Pharmacies are also allowed to dispense this medication to individuals without a prescription. If it's an auto injector or a nasal spray form, um, not all pharmacies operate under this policy, but all CVS and all Walgreens do in Florida, and we're working to get other states operating under this policy, which is what's called a standing order. Um, so you don't have to get a direct prescription from your physician, which is a huge barrier uh, for people who need access to naloxone. Um, and then we just have some Florida law enforcement departments that we know of um, on the screen who either are planning to or have equipped their officers with naloxone. Um, there's about 17, some of them are, two of them are campus police departments, some sheriffs, and some police departments around the state. Um, so we have some numbers on a few of them in terms of how many times they've used naloxone. Um, you know, when it comes to some law enforcement, the perception may be EMS is literally always there first, we're never going to use this medication. I would advise you to look at your, your local EMS response times. Um, instead of just the average EMS response, response time is X amount of minutes. If you can actually look at how many times, uh, you know, the X number of times where law enforcement was actually at the scene of an overdose first, and then how many minutes before were they there before EMS. And it could be a sensitive topic. It's not trying to be critical of EMS response times. It's really just trying to show that law enforcement may be able to intervene and save a life um, in these situations. So among some of these departments as well, who may not have thought that they would use it as much, um, we have seen a pretty high utilization from the ones using it. Uh, I only have information on some of them. So Delray Beach Police Department, for example, started their program in March of 2016, equipping just their sergeants at first with naloxone. Um, from March to like August of last year, they used it over 70 times. Um, and they used it as soon as they equipped their officers within 24 hours to reverse an overdose at a sober home. Um, with Orange County Sheriffs, it's either Orange County Sheriffs or Orlando Police Department um, have used it about 45 times. Uh, Sarasota County Sheriff's Department were the first ones in the state to equip their officers with naloxone uh, in December of 2015. And for, I think it was from December to maybe June of last year, they had used it about 50 times as well. Um, I don't have updated numbers on all of these departments, but we have seen pretty high utilization of the ones that have equipped their officers with it. Um, these are just some positive messaging when it comes to um, promoting naloxone use in the community um, or saving somebody's life with this medication. We do have a list of resources up here, some of the links to the manufacturers. Um, some basic information about naloxone. I'm going to highlight the Law Enforcement Naloxone Toolkit from the Bureau of Justice Alliance. It's their Training and Technical Assistance Center. Um, that's where we pulled a lot of those protocols, policies, and procedures, and reporting documents. So I would really uh, advise you guys to look at that website. It's all specific to law enforcement and has examples of all of that on there. Um, so that could really help your agency when it comes to if you are interested in this type of program. So I'm going to stop here in a couple minutes and just say 
Miranda and myself uh, with the Department of Children and Families are available to, if you're interested, in, if your agency is interested to provide training to the officers. Um, we don't charge anything for the training. Um, and we can help with the purchasing process in terms of which products you might want to go with and, you know, which manufacturer and how you set up those accounts and everything. So I'll kind of stop that here and see if we have any questions. Okay, at this time we're going to unmute the line, and if anyone has any questions, you can uh, feel free to shout them out, or you can also send your questions through the dashboard. Do we have any questions? So I see one on the screen that asks if there is a grant available. So in terms of specific to law enforcement, I'm not sure uh, at the moment. There are certainly grants in the past uh, that have been available specific to either drug courts in combination with law enforcement uh, or ones that counties can apply for for naloxone. Um, the manufacturers do sometimes provide free products. It's kind of just on a rolling basis. It's not a formal grant program, uh, but it's kind of called their donation grants program. So I would, uh, we'd be happy to kind of talk about that offline with your agency if you're interested um, and show you that website where you can basically just set up an account. You would need a prescriber to prescribe the medication to your law enforcement officers or sign off on the policy. Um, as I understand it, law enforcement either has a medical director that you would work with as a consultant or it could be the EMS medical director in your county. So if you have that information and we can work with that, we can apply for free products from the manufacturers. Uh, DCF is applying, you know, we've, we have our own naloxone initiative where we've been trying to get um, naloxone out through our drug treatment centers to prescribe and dispense to individuals uh, at risk of, of relapse and maybe overdose as well as their friends and family members. At this point, we haven't had enough. We've already run out to be able to supply it to law enforcement. Um, but if we do in the future, then we would be able to apply. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Okay, if not, we'd like to uh, thank you, Amanda, uh, for being here as well as Miranda. Um, really enjoyed the presentation. Um, before you use the, the contact information on how to reach both Amanda and Miranda, um, at the Department of Children and Families. We will also make this PowerPoint presentation available via the FSA webpage. Um, and so if you have any other questions, please feel free to give them a call or you can contact myself here at the Florida Sheriff's Association. Thank you again for participating and you all have a wonderful afternoon.